because the eyes pupils are too too close to adapt to the lighting conditions in the cockpit because we have light like in the office to work. But if we switch off all the lights in the cockpit, absolutely all the lights, all the computer screens, in an attitude such that the sun and the earth are in the opposite side, after a few minutes when your eyes adapt to obscurity, the black sky becomes white of stars and they don't twinkle because you don't see them through the atmosphere. So your first feeling is, wow, all these stars. And you know, thanks to the Hubble Space Telescope, we know that we, in our universe, there are 100 billion galaxies in our visible universe. And each galaxy is 100 billion stars. That means for you who are engineers, if you multiply the two, that's several 10,000 billions of billions of stars in our visible universe, just the visible universe. And around the closest stars, we see planets. So it is hard to believe that there are no other planets in similar conditions than ours. So my preference is to believe that there are life somewhere out there, maybe not necessarily intelligent life, but there are life out there. And uh, I would be very happy if someday they visit, they visit us to give us some good advice. But I have no proof they exist, I have no proof they don't exist. But the absence of proof is not the proof of absence. So anybody can think what they want, but I, I prefer to believe that they are not alone. Great answer. Now we're in a room full of engineers and, and potential engineers and related industries. How did your engineering background help you and lead you to go into uh, the profession of being an astronaut? I think uh, when you are an engineer, you like to understand things. You, love, you like to understand how things work and how to make things work better or how to invent uh, uh, a tool and equipment a machine that will help you do something that was not possible before. When you are a pilot, you like just to fly machines. Uh, you don't care about how people invent them. Uh, when you are a scientist, you do research and you try to understand more fundamental things. So being in the middle as an engineer, I was an engineer by, by background initially, uh, I was interested to understand the equations of how things work. I like to touch, I like to test, I was a flight test engineer. I was uh, the first uh, to introduce in Europe this uh, public flight uh, program because before the scientists in Europe were flying the vomit comet, the way they call it the vomit comet, you know, this, this aircraft flying like this. But we, all the scientists in Europe were flying in NASA in Houston, Texas. And when 28 years ago I told the French Space Agency and the German Space Agency, I can, I can start a parabolic flight program in Europe based on the European aircraft to provide weightlessness in, uh, in the zero-g uh, airplane. They trusted me and we did it. So you, you need to have this uh, engineering uh, spirit. But remember, the first characteristic of being a good engineer is first to be able to write in very good language, very good English or French, what you want, to write the specification. This is the first quality that we require from a good engineer, to be able to describe precisely what he or she wants. Then after you, you, you must be good at equations, etc. But first you must be able to be able to write down properly what is the thing you are looking for. And after, after that you have also administrative work, and that's part of everybody in life. But I was very interested to see during your presentation the effects that space travel has on the human body, and, and particularly the things that you might suffer, and how quickly the human body can adapt to that, and then just carry on for weeks and months, as you can. What sort of medical testing do you have to go through to allow you to become an astronaut in the first place? So in Russia, they had a test that we don't do on the, on the, on the west side, but I went through that, this is a vomiting chair, the rotating chair, I don't know if you heard about this test. You're sitting on a chair like, like me, like this, and we rotate uh, at the speed of uh, 30, 30 RPM. And at the same time you spin, you have to tilt your head like this, forward, aft, left, right, and try to stay conscious. 
and not as for that. And that's not an easy test, but uh, it proved eventually that it was not a very uh, uh, interesting test for space, space flight. I am seasick, I take medication on the boat, it should not be seasick, but I was not sick in space. And I know people who are not sick on the boat and who use the vomiting bag in space. And so that's the non uh, funny part. But as far as uh, preparation, we test uh, high Gs in centrifuge. We have a few parabolic flights for uh, experiencing weightlessness before our first uh, space flight. And mostly, most of the medical screening is just uh, being in good health. There is nothing special that we are required to do or to train for as far as the medical uh, aspect. Uh, we are just being uh, told in details, expect all this and this and this to happen in your body. And uh, some of you may find it uh, not very nice for the first few days or few hours. But eventually everybody feel, feel well. Uh, uh, it's only when we come back we, we remember that uh, there is gravity in our life. And uh, for a few hours uh, we feel very, very heavy. We are not allowed to drive for a few days because the risk of having an accident is too high. Uh, and we suggest strongly to men to not procreate for the for the, the few weeks after five because our our reproducing cells are not uh, uh, reliable. I think everybody should go home today and nominate a friend, colleague, or family member to do the vomiting chair test and see how they get on. Okay, there's a lot of people here who've come to see you uh, and hear you today, John. So I'm going to.